So welcome to your first lecture, Requirements Engineering. Today is going to be a light lecture. We're just going to talk about the foundations uh, of the subject. So first of all, a little bit of motivation. Why is it important at all? Why should you care? Then second, we'll have a look at the overview on Requirements Engineering. And then finally, start getting slowly but surely into the actual process of Requirements Engineering. So welcome to the motivations of requirements engineering. While we are talking about computer science in particular for this course, um, you also might have encountered some requirements engineering problems yourself in your daily life. For example, you started studying, that means you might have actually moved to a different city, that means you need a flat or at least some other place to stay. And when you were looking for this place to stay, you had certain implicit but also explicit requirements in mind. Most of the students do not have an unlimited budget. That means there is like an upper price tag. You also have some ideas of how much space you need. Is five square meters enough or do you need 50 square meters? The same goes for the location and how much you have to pay for other stuff. Do you want to like to live together with someone else or not? All of those are requirements that come to us quite naturally. And we can find various other examples like buying a car, buying a new notebook, buying a new phone, or maybe also a used phone. That would be another requirement. So there are like various aspects of requirements engineering that you encounter in your daily life. For this particular lecture, we're of course going to focus more on the computer science aspects of requirements engineering and also in the context of computer science. So mostly some kind of software or maybe sometimes hardware related uh, problems or projects. So why do you need a requirement engineering? You need to figure out what something that you are supposed to develop, build or create is supposed to do. So basic example, someone needs software for a professional activity or as part of a product, someone needs to create that. And you are in a lucky position that you're a computer scientist and you might be able to do that. Even though you're also not fluent in all different kinds of computing languages, you might be good at front-end web development, but you might be bad at back-end, or you might not even have a clue on how to do some kind of assembly programming on hardware. So even if you're a really good programmer, you probably can't do everything yourself, so you have to communicate to someone else what you actually need. And that's pretty much why we need requirements engineering. Um, the other options, of course, you just buy a product off the shelf, but even there you need to do some kind of requirements engineering a little bit because you need to know what you actually want and what the products that you would like to have can do. And therefore, for both options, the requirements must be known, and that means we somehow have to get there. And this is pretty much what the whole course is about. What are the requirements, understanding them, and then also documenting them and using them in the real world process. And it's in particular important because one of the vital components or the vital aspects or the vital parameters that define, determine whether one of your projects is successful or not is related to requirements. So here you can find an overview of a survey where they ask professionals what are the reasons why your project failed or why it was uh, not successful. And while there are some problems with a lack of IT management or lack of planning or unrealistic expectations, requirements are showing up twice in that list. First, on position number one, because the requirements were just incomplete. And then something that might become a problem even if your requirements are perfect and complete is the fact that requirements can change over time and someone has to account for that. So we'll cover both of those uh, pitfalls and we'll tell you exactly how you can master or manage those problems. Getting into some examples. So what happens if you have inadequate requirements? So we're first just going to look at what can go wrong and then we go or move forward to how can you avoid going wrong. So let's say you have the task of being part of an Airbus plane design team and the requirement is that the reverse reverse thrust may only be used when the airplane is landed. So you don't, you're not trying to fly backwards mid-air. Um, this requirement is then translated as the reverse thrust may only be used while the wheels are rotating. Because usually mid-air your wheels are not rotating. Um, 
therefore it's an indicator that you have landed. And the actual implementation in the real world product is the reverse thrust may only be used while the wheels are rotating fast enough. Sounds reasonable um, because it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do, but it misses an important key feature here. Let's assume we have a situation with a rainstorm where you have aquaplaning. Aquaplaning means your wheels might not be rotating at all. The result, you crash due to overshooting the runway because you could not uh, apply reverse thrust, which is a problem. Um, this might now feel super artificial, this problem, but this is not really far away from the future. If you Google requirements, engineering fuck ups or bad examples, you will find a lot of really weird and bad examples where you're like, okay, how could you not see this coming? But once you're actually in a project of various stakeholders, huge complex structures, then you will understand how this could happen. And some of those things that we're gonna teach you throughout this course are supposed to prevent that. There are other general examples of an inadequate requirements engineering process. There could be missing requirements, which are the worst, or not the worst, but like pretty serious. Um, so something where people just assume that this is given. Like, of course, we need to print reports. Why would you think we do not need to print reports is one example there. Uh, you could also have inadequate requirements, like providing an optimal delivery route for each truck within one millisecond, or implicit requirements, where you just assume that someone knows what you're doing. They're sometimes linked to missing requirements, but an implicit one could be something, there should only be one train on a railway segment at the same time. If there are multiple or more than one, potential crash. You can also have inconsistent requirements, so having one or multiple requirements that somehow have like some, some dependency and do not properly match. You could, for example, have a requirement that says only approved personnel may be allowed to menu level two, but in order to get to this approval, one need to use a level two function to request that approval. So you cannot request it because you're not level two, therefore you cannot request level two, but you also don't get to level two. Quite confusing, but you get the idea. And something that we're gonna spend quite some time on are so-called ambiguous requirements um, that are requirements, but not really clear because there are usually multiple ways of interpreting that requirement. Like after inserting the card and the pin, provide access to the menu within two seconds. Um, there are different interpretations to that problem. So what is the actual behavior of the system that you would like to see and what is the actual behavior of the system that will be implemented? So what are the more general tasks of requirements in the requirements engineering process? They are in general the results that the stakeholders want and while we're gonna spend a little bit more time to define what stakeholders are in detail. Uh, in general, stakeholders of the systems are persons, organizations that have a direct or indirect influence on the requirements of the system. So the users, the customer who buys or wants the system, uh, but also other people like organizations who make rules that your system has to adhere to and other things. They usually represent different viewpoints, at least for more complex projects. That's often the case. If it's a super simple one, then might only uh, have one or two viewpoints, but in complex systems like the airplane that we talked about before, more difficult. Um, they accept products against precise criteria, so request for a proposal and then contract structuring. So what are you asking someone to develop for what price and how do you decide whether the actual product or the deliverable has then met the criteria, so you need something tangible. Uh, they also help in the communication between stakeholders and developers, because the stakeholders have to say like, what do we want? And then the developers have to build what they are building. And they also help to get a common understanding of a desired product. Challenges is something we'll probably talk about throughout the whole lecture, but just to get you started on the challenges of this process, let's have a look at some of the high-level challenges. 
So first challenge that you will encounter many, many times in the reality is our unclear objectives. Um, some of you might have been active web developers and you have friends who are like, hey, you, you can do websites. Can you build me a cool, fancy website that can do X? Just build me something like Facebook or I need something similar to this or just something similar. Then you're like, first of all, I don't have time. And second of all, if they can convince you to do it, then you're like, okay, what can it do? Yeah, just like Facebook, just like that or, you know, what you, what like to have when you do this. So super vague, often stakeholders that want to give you a task don't really know themselves what they're doing. And I experienced that myself many, many times when I was working in any of my startups or with my own company where we also did uh, some software development for customers that they had a rough idea, but when they then really had to write down what explicitly they want, there was a lot of thinking required to get to the actual goal. So you're also a little bit like the helping hand to guide them to what they want or help them to express what they want. Um, so those are like among the reasons why we have unclear uh, objectives. Another reason why you could have them is that you not only have one stakeholder who doesn't really know what he or she wants, but actually multiple of them also with them contrary percep perceptions of the reality. There could also be a bad coordination between the stakeholders, which makes it even more difficult. And low imagination, that is also not really helping in the process of getting the requirements out of the head of the stakeholders. Uh, another broader topic of challenges is related to the high complexity. No individual knows every detail of the desired product at least if you're talking about the sufficient complexity of a product. That means you need to talk to a lot of people, the challenges of communication is something that we're gonna talk about in a second. And if you are considering large enterprises as customers, then you're also in the bureaucratic administrative sphere of those companies. That means complex business processes, boundaries, rules, wishes, not only for the administrative stuff, but also for those environments where your product might be used. Let's say you're building like an internal communication app for a big, large corporation with 20,000 people. There are a lot of complex business processes, boundaries, rules, and wishes that you have to adhere to. And then something super trivial, which then it's gonna lead us to communication issues in a few minutes, are language barriers. Um, really like simple, just native speakers versus foreign language speakers could be something. So I can express myself somehow decent in English, but I'm not a native speaker. And if I talk to a native speaker, they might use words in a different way that I'm not aware of that they exist or are correct. They might have a strong accent. That could also be an influence factor. I lived in Scotland. They have a wonderful language that I did not really understand properly at all times. The same goes for Switzerland and other countries. And then you also have, uh, even among native speakers or speakers of a a homogeneous group, you might have something like professional, professional uh, words or general versus computer science. Some words just mean something different depending on what your peer group is. So those things are also challenges that you have to deal with and to account for. Another challenges are related to changing requirements. Uh, vague requirements could become more detailed or should become more detailed during the development. Uh, but you could also have just something simple as, okay, we had a perfect requirement, but then an underlying business process changed. So let's say the tax rate was changed by the government from five to 6%. And that might be relevant for one of your requirement. So during development, you have to change that requirement and that could cause some problems down the road. Bad quality of requirements due to ambiguity, inconsistency, or just being imprecise could be like major challenges. We've talked about those in the examples. Um, unnecessary features is something that you will encounter quite often, but not, not really expect as a problem. Because, but it is actually like quite painful when you have customers who are usually called that gold plating, where have functions and features that are not required to be part of the system definition, but they want to push this in because if you talk to a marketing person, 
they might have a very different focus or very different priority of certain things than you might have as a developer. We're saying like, yeah, I understand that you like this, but this is not relevant for what we're talking about now. And then imprecise planning, as always, not only related to software engineering, is also something that is gonna be challenging. And now moving to the challenge of communication in itself that I already teasered on the last slide. Most of you probably know this uh, telephone game that you might have played as children. Um, if not, just click the YouTube link. Um, there are different variations, but the basic instructions or the basic um, modus is pretty much like you have a row of people and then someone starts, let's say person A, whispering a piece of information into the ear of person B, then you go to person C, person D, and then usually what person D tells person A is completely different. The longer the line, the more information are lost or changed. You can make this slightly more challenging by not speaking into the ear of someone else, but using a sheet of paper and a pen and draw a piece of information on the back of the person in front of you. So even if this might be just a square and this person is then supposed to paint it or draw it on the back of the person before them, uh, usually after two or three uh, people, you can barely recognize the original figure that was drawn on the first person's back, despite them usually being super simple. What am I trying to say here? It, giving information from one person to another is quite tricky and gets rather impossible the more person you have in the line, the more person are involved in transferring a certain piece of information. And if you abstract this now from this rather silly but illustrative example, you're getting more to the fundamentals of communication theory, where you usually have a sender who encodes information in some way, could be words, could be the thing print, uh, drawn on the back of a person before you, and then the receiver receives those information has to decode them, listening or understanding what the drawn lines on, the, on your back mean. So whenever you communicate, someone needs to send information, someone needs to receive them, there's an encoding and decoding of information. Usually, you use natural language to do that. I'm using now natural language by the means of speaking to communicate information about the fundamentals of communication theory to you, and you are right now, hopefully, properly decoding the information that I would like to convey. So this is like what we usually do, either by speaking, by reading, or some other ways of, of, of natural language uh, processing capabilities. So what a person, the sender, says or writes and codes is not necessarily the same as what another person, receiver, understands and then decodes. Communication in natural languages depends on several factors. So we talked about native versus um, professional, uh, na native versus uh, foreigner from the language perspective, uh, but also from a cultural backgrounds. Certain words can mean certain things. The educational background also makes a lot of sense. If I'm now using super academic terms while talking to an elementary school child, I might not really make a lot of progress in our communication here. Then area of expertise, marketing versus someone who is super deep into the physics of airplane brakes. Um, everyday work life also is something uh, is a factor in there. And then the communication medium. I have hopefully a great microphone now. You hopefully have great speakers or a great headphone so that the great quality, audio quality that we are recording is easily transferred to your and you can easily decode it. Then additionally, you also have this visual spectrum and you can also read the information that we're trying to convey on your screen. So if those or any of those is in a really bad quality, communication suffers. Having multiple streams of communication can help to prevent some communication problems, but it could also add too much complexity so that you lose it information again or just getting confused. So for example, if what I'm saying doesn't match the slides, then you might be confused. Other things to consider in this context of communication uh, theory are different communication media have different properties. Verbal communication and written communication are different and inherently different. 
Um, for example, verbal communication relies heavily on redundancy, language, gesture, intonation, and uh, immediate feedback is possible when you talk to someone. You, unfortunately, can only listen to this video, but if we would have a live lecture or live in-person exercises, then there could be an immediate feedback response. You could just look confused and then I could react or you could just yell at me and telling me to repeat what I just said. In written communication, it's slightly different. Usually there is minimum redundancy and the feedback is often delayed. Sure, that somehow changed with all the social media and messenger capabilities of most modern devices. It's not as bad as with like paper letters before, but still there is some kind of delay. You usually make more time in written communication than you need for verbal communication. Sometimes required information is not transferred at all. It's also a problem or a challenge that you need to adhere. Certain information is left out due to wrong misguided focus. So I'm trying to focus now here on requirements engineering, especially the communication aspect of requirements engineering. But I could go completely off the rails and talk about something completely different and that would represent in missing focus or a lack of a proper focus. Simplification can be a challenge. Complex parts of the information are excluded. If I try to explain a super complex thing like quantum theory to an elementary school uh, student, I will simplify things, but the requirements that I can convey using that simplified language are not sufficient to build something meaningful in the quantum computing space. Oversimplified language use could be a problem, but could be helpful. Like sometimes you have to simplify, then you need certain complexity. And also wrong expectations of existing knowledge are a problem. Uh, either from the marketing person about the product of the company that they're trying to sell. Maybe I'm a new developer, maybe I'm an external developer and I haven't ever heard of their product. But the marketing people could just assume that you already know what the product is supposed to do. And then, last but not least here, agreed upon common language uses, uh, usage improves communication. So we'll talk about glossaries as part of the requirements engineering process later, but having a glossary that contains terms that you have defined together so that everyone knows what they mean in the context of this product helps to avoid ambiguous communication, actually makes it easier. Why are software requirements slightly special compared to maybe looking for a new flat or other requirements that you encounter in your daily life? Um, software is especially different to physical things that you can touch. Uh, it's more universal, almost no restriction of the area of explication. Requirements also have almost no bounds, same mean for many areas of applications, many things are taken for granted. So that, that requires from your side to be very like strict with the requirements engineering process, but also more sensitive to those challenges. Uh, software is also amorphous. It means it has no shape. You cannot properly visualize it. If marketing asks you to build a cube, a physical cube, then you can show this to them and ask them, is this what you wanted to see? If you build the software that controls the brake of a car, make sure you can like test the brakes with them in the car if they dare to get into the car with your braking software. Uh, but there's not really something to show. Sure, websites can be shown in a certain way and you can test them, but a lot of software is, yeah, it has no shape. You can't touch it, you can't see it. It's also not monotone. Problems can always occur just because three and five work. Doesn't mean that four is actually working. And users and customers think anything is possible, which is partially true. This is why you're probably gonna pay very well, um, but also more possibilities means that requirements need to be way more detailed than what most stakeholders have in mind when they ask you to do something.